Hi everyone, um, welcome to this Inside Uni event, um, which we're really excited to be doing today. It's um, with students from Oxford and Cambridge who are either estranged or care leavers, and it's about what the experience is like at Oxbridge and also um, applying from a situation like that. Um, so I think it's going to be a really interesting event. Um, my name's uh, Tommy, I'm one of the people who started Inside Uni, um, and I'm also a social worker in London at the moment, um, and I'm going to be chairing the event. Um, it's probably going to take about an hour today, although it might be shorter. Um, and basically, we're going to talk through um, each person. Um, we're going to hear a bit about their experiences. Um, and we're also going to answer questions um, that we've either had pre-submitted in advance um, or ones that you can submit live um, on YouTube um, as we go through. Um, so you can just use the live comments box to do that. And our moderator, Helena, is in the chat um, and she'll copy them over so that we can address them. Um, and don't be shy, so get them in early and um, we'll answer them as we go. Um, just to explain a little bit as well about what Inside Uni is. Um, so Inside Uni is a student run project um, in Oxford and Cambridge, um, which aims to give information that you'd get if you knew someone at Oxford or Cambridge and were able to have that kind of word of mouth advice, um, but it puts it online so that everyone can get it for free. So if you visit insideuni.org, um, you'll be able to find advice there on interviews. So we've got 2000 students who have given us testimonies from their interviews across Oxford and Cambridge. And we've got subject guides um, for most subjects. Uh, we've also got more general resources uh, on things like finances uh, and access programs that you can be part of. So even though I'm biased, I definitely think you should go and check that out if you're thinking of applying. Um, so that's what Inside Uni is. Um, and I think now would be a good time just for everyone on the call to introduce themselves. Um, so Sophia, did you want to kick off? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, my name's Sophia. Uh, I was at Oxford University and I studied music and I graduated in 2018. Hello, my name is Charlie. I'm at Cambridge. I study modern languages. So I do French and I did Spanish from scratch in first year because I never did it at A-level, so I picked it up at university. Um, I'm also involved in something called Class Act, which is a group at Cambridge which aims to support people from all kinds of disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and I'm the acting care leavers, estranged and homeless students officer at the minute. So um, yeah, if you do come to Cambridge, get in contact with us. Hi, I'm Bri. Um, I've just finished my first year of law at Oxford. Um, and similarly to Charlie, I am also involved in Class Act at Oxford um, and I'm the current Care Leavers Rep. Hello everyone, I'm Chloe, a first year Earth Scientist at the University of Oxford. Great. Um, so the structure of the call is going to be that we're going to start off um, with a few day in the lives um, so that you get a bit of a clearer picture about what it's actually like to be at Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, then we're going to go on to answering questions, so either the pre-submitted ones or the, the live ones that you can put in um, throughout the course of the event, and that will probably take the bulk of the call. Um, and then towards the end, um, with about 10 minutes to go, we'll look at um, some resource recommendations from everyone on the panel, um, and then we'll wrap it up. So that's how it's going to go today. So to kick it off then, um, Chloe, did you want to give what your day in the life is like at um, Oxford? <laughs> so I'm a morning person, so I get up at like six in the morning and I go straight for breakfast and then I head straight to the gym. And then because I'm a science subject, we normally have lectures in the morning. So by the time I finished working out, I head straight to the department where we do lectures <laughs> um, for nine o'clock. And then normally I'll go back to college to have lunch and then back again to department for lectures in the afternoon. And then when I come back, um, I either go to the library or eat dinner with my friends. Um, but normally some sort of uh, studying in the evening and then like a social activity. Um, but this year I made the mistake of not joining any societies. Um, so next year I've learned from my mistakes and I'm going to join um, the French society just to occupy my time a bit because this year I focused too much on work I think and I was a bit too hard on myself but every day was pretty much the same <laughs> um, but yeah I think the day in your life is is pretty adaptable to and you can make it suit your lifestyle so you don't have to get up at six in the morning it's just what I prefer to do and that's pretty much it. <laughs> 
Um, I'm a humanities student, so my day in the life is a little bit different, so I'll tell you something about that. Um, generally, I would have maybe 10 to 15 hours of classes or supervision per week. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, I might only have two or three um, classes. So I might have a lecture uh, on kind of literature in the languages that I'm studying. I might have a language class or a translation class and then potentially a supervision, but I would generally only have two or three supervisions a week, which is um, really small group teaching. It's generally you and one other person and an academic who reads an essay and gives you feedback on it. But um, really only had maybe six of those a term. So yeah, in my day-to-day -day life isn't actually that full. So I have a little bit more time for uh, extracurriculars, like doing things with Class Act. I also write for our student paper. I did some editing for our student paper a little bit as well. I also, I made the same mistake as you, Chloe, in first year, and I didn't do enough um, extracurriculars. So in my second year, I really threw myself into them all. Um, and it was definitely worth it because I had a lot more fun and I was less less head down all the time. I think, you know, when you come to Oxbridge, you think that uh, you have to be working really, really hard all the time, but you definitely don't have to be. Uh, there is time for friends and social activities and things like that. Um, so my day in the life's a little bit different. Um, to Chloe's at Oxbridge, I get up at six. I get up sort of more at nine o'clock. Um, lawyers don't have well, we didn't have in our first year any 9 a.m.s. Um, so I get up, quite, have quite a slow morning. Um, we normally go down to a local coffee shop or down to the college bar where they serve like breakfast. Um, and then lectures are sort of around one o'clock, one, one till three normally. Um, but then we would also go to the library. Um, a lot of law is... Um, about reading so our lectures we really only have about five hours a week of um, and everything else is taken up by reading um, and preparing for tutorials which is similar to as Charlie's um, described supervisions um, but that also means that I've been able to get in involved with quite a lot of access work um, which is what I've sort of done as my extracurricular this year um, this has involved sort of lots of touring of schools um, getting involved in question days, um, shadowing days, and also a bit of tutoring. Um, but it's meant that I can sort of, I work later into the evening um, and get involved with that during sort of school time hours when people are around. And I know, I know I've graduated, but I wanted to jump in because I also made a mistake in my first year but that was because I joined too many societies and I, I signed up for everything possible. I was on my college's rowing team. I found something at Oxford called Cave Club, which I decided I was gonna join. Uh, I was in like every music society ever. And I realized by second year that I had to calm down a bit because I was there to do a degree after all. Um, but my my day to day was very different just because I did music and I'd say we had at tops three tutorials. So one on one meetings with a tutor um, a week and then we might have three to four lectures a week as well. So there could be just one day where I didn't have anything and I would use that to practice um, or to go do one of the millions of societies I was in. Um, and also as a musician, I got to play at loads of really cool events at Oxford. Uh, whilst I was at Oxford, I performed at over 40 balls. So like, there's always something going on at Oxford that you can get involved with, especially when you're a musician. So yeah, my, my time at Oxford was definitely split quite almost like 60, 40 with work and fun stuff. Nice. Well, thanks everyone. That was really interesting to hear that. And um, I'm sure everyone listening will be able to hear just how different everyone's experiences are and how you can make it what you want to make it basically. And so I, I think that's always the most interesting thing with these um, day in the lives is that you can just see how different everyone's experiences is. And, um, everyone doesn't have to just go and work all day every day um, so that's important to remember great so now we can go on to um, some questions um, so just a reminder that if you want to submit questions whilst you're watching live um, you can just write them into the YouTube comments section in the live stream bit um, and Helena our moderator will pick them up and bring them over to the document so that we can um, address them in the call um, but before we get to that um, we're going to go over some areas that we've thought of in advance that we think might be interesting for you guys to hear about. 
Um, so jump in on the YouTube comments section at any point if you want to say something or if you want to ask any questions um, and we'll add them to the list. Um, but to start off with, um, Bride, did you want to kick off with the first question? Yeah, so the first question is who will support me if I want to apply to university and I'm in care? Um, and you can get support from sort of a mixture of places um, if you want to apply to university. You can um, get support, obviously, first and foremost from school. I relied really heavily on my head of sixth form um, to help me with my personal statement, but also to sort of signpost me before I apply to university to different events, different um, sort of like summer schools and things to get involved with. And then she was also really useful in helping me pick a course. Um, but local authorities can also offer support. So they can offer um, different levels of financial support depending on which local authority you're with and also um, in my experience, I've had a education sort of lead who has been sort of the, the main person to go to about any education issues. So it was him that sorted um, any funding. It was him who helped to pay for my admissions test because for Oxford, you have to do the um, law national aptitude test, which I think is £50. Pounds. Um, so he sort of paid for that. It can also be really difficult to apply to university if you're a care leaver and living on your own. Um, so my birthday's in September. So I turned 18 the year before I applied to university. So I rented a house on my own and sort of just lived with just me and my cat. Um, and that was quite difficult, but also then because my school were aware of that and my university were aware of that, um, all the universities I was applying to were aware of it as well. There was a lot of support put in place for things such as um, helping to pay for internet and also um, to help for um, yeah so other things just sort of like booking uh, booking my tests and things like that so there's lots of support in lots of different places. Something that uh, to jump in something that I also think is a really cool idea um, no matter if you end up applying for Oxford or Cambridge or another university is typing in a university's name followed by the words care lever or foster child or looked after because there is you know a bit of a chance that someone who has been through that university as a care lever might have written about it or they might have posted about it. Um, and I, I did the same thing when I applied to Oxford and Cambridge and when I was in my second year at Oxford there was a care leaver at Cambridge who wrote a big ar article in the Guardian about being a care leaver at Cambridge and I was so excited to find someone who had been through like the same stuff as me that I reached out to them and we're now really good mates and so I know that there's quite a few of us um, on the sort of YouTube scene and social media scene. And if you see someone who's been to university as a care leaver, honestly, like DM them, like just, just send them a message and say, hi, I'm considering applying for this. And I think stuff like this is a really good example of why that's great because you wanna hear firsthand how Oxford or Cambridge or wherever is as someone from your background or your situation. So my, my advice is never be scared to, you know, cold message someone. If you find someone who's had the same experience as you, email them, DM them, Facebook them, contact them. Nice, and Sophia, did you wanna also um, talk a bit about the next question? Yes, I did. Um, so the next question is, should I tell people I'm estranged slash care experienced and the first thing I want to talk about with this is on the UCAS form there's a box I can't remember whereabouts in the form someone please correct me if you can remember whereabouts it is um, but there's a box you can tick to say if you are care experienced um, and by ticking this box you're not outing yourself as a care leaver to the world like when you arrive at university there's not going to be a massive banner saying you know foster kid come here it's very much just so the university admissions team understands that they can offer you certain scholarships that you will be eligible for. Um, your tutor won't find out. Like I was really worried that my tutor would have a really biased opinion about me. I had all these concerns, none of which came, turned out to be true. But I was so worried about her finding out. She didn't know until I disclosed it to her. It's very much just about admissions and welfare and scholarships and that kind of thing. 
Um, just as a sort of little anecdote on this, um, obviously I applied in 2018. Um, I ticked the box on the UCAS form and as soon as I got my offer, which was at the beginning of January, I was invited straight down to Oxford. My college um, helped me sort out accommodation. They helped me sort out um, the fact that I had no internet. So they funded a little sort of internet dongle type thing. Um, they also helped me. They said that I could see the room that I was going to get um, and lots of other things that just made me feel a lot more settled, but also reassured me that no one would know unless I wanted them to know. Um, so ticking the box is like really useful and definitely something that if you feel comfortable doing, I would recommend you do. I just want to add that I also tick the box, but as I was applying to all the universities that I applied to, my personal sixth form tutor emailed or sent a letter, I think. <laughs> to all the universities saying you know just you know just telling them about my situation first and then when I um got my offer I got in contact well I got um contacted by the welfare team at my college and so that I didn't have to tell anyone myself we agreed that the welfare team would discuss it with tutors because I wanted them to be aware but then I didn't want to have the conversation so that's also helpful. Our next question is, will Oxford slash Cambridge provide 365 accommodation? So accommodation all year round, because obviously um, terms are only, at least at Cambridge, they're only eight weeks long. I'm not sure about Oxford. So there is actually quite a big gap between terms where um, some people go home, some people stay at college. Um, and the answer to this is yes, is that they can indeed provide accommodation all the way through the year. Um, but at least in my experience, it wasn't something that happened automatically. It's something that I had to uh, flag up and apply for, especially for accommodation over the summer. Um, I had to apply for that quite early on because there's quite a lot of demand um, for accommodation over the summer. And it was also a little bit more expensive, obviously, because you're there for a little bit longer, you have to pay slightly more rent. Um, but in general, most people who are estranged or care leave will have more financial support. And if that's something that doesn't apply to you, then you can um, ask for rent reductions or rent bursaries in order to help you pay your rent over the breaks. Um, so yeah, I, I stayed over my breaks in my college uh, and I'm currently in Cambridge now over, over lockdown. Um, just to jump in on that, um, it is also worth, worth asking your local authority what they will fund um, because I'm lucky enough that mine fund my accommodation um, because they you know need to keep me housed. Um, so ask your local authority, do chase your local authority about anything um, you could possibly sort of get get from them because you know they might fund things or they might offer sort of a bit of money towards it um so really do go for it um with the next question is what is it like to be in oxford or cambridge during the holidays um so i moved in to oxford six weeks before the freshers moved in um so i think i moved in at the beginning of september um, my accommodation was offered to me straight away by my college as I mentioned before um, they told me they could do 365 accommodation in January um, and for me at that point it was quite strange just because um, you know you go to uni and you expect there to be lots of people there but it was very very quiet but also it's nice in a way because it means that you can sort of really get to know your city do the touristy things that you might not have time to do during term time um, and just sort of really get to know where you are and I found that really useful because I could settle before lots of other people came. Um, I was also there during lockdown um, which was obviously strange as it was for anyone but it was also really nice to go and find the greener areas of Oxford that I'd not explored so I went to sort of we've got um, uni parks and some nice walks that I just you know used my daily exercise to go and do so it's really worth exploring when you've got the time to do it in the holidays yeah as i as i just mentioned i'm i also stay in cambridge over the break so for me i actually really enjoyed it because term is so hectic and so kind of 
smash into these 12 weeks that it's not 12 weeks eight weeks that it's actually really nice to get some time in cambridge when there's no one there well, I, I maybe it makes me a massive nerd but i really enjoyed the libraries when they were empty <laughs> like sitting in a library and like having no one on a table with you is just one of the nicest things <laughs> that maybe i've been like conditioned by cambridge to think this um but yeah over lockdown i was also here it was a bit spooky <laughs> Um, but something that I've made an effort to do with class action and I'm hoping will continue uh, even when I'm no longer in, in the role is to run events over the breaks for people who are here. So we have um, like an estranged students group chat. So there's actually quite a lot of solidarity and we try and organize events anyway. Um, but it's a good thing being involved with class because they can fund events and buy, buy the snacks. So <laughs> I buy the most expensive snacks I can when someone else is paying. Um, so there's definitely groups you can get involved in there's um group chats and solidarity around um don't feel like you have to be lonely and stuck in your room all the time because there are people around who can support you speaking about uh events and stuff uh i think this happens in uh, a re relative amount of cities now there's something called the christmas dinner which uh, is a group of people who get together and basically put on a Christmas dinner on Christmas Day for care experienced people, uh, which is a really nice event. Um, I've spent Christmas by myself and honestly it sucks. So it's really cool that they, they have stuff like that. Um, as much as I loved like staying in Oxford during the holidays, I think it got to a point halfway through my second year where I just felt quite lonely. Um, and a few of my friends knew like my my background or at least that I didn't have a family to go home to. And so I, I would get invites, you know, oh, do you want to come and stay at Haas during the holiday? And I'd always be like, no, 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 no. My advice is accept the invites. Like at the end of the day, you're at Oxford with people who maybe can, you know, are able to invite you around to their family, family home accept the invites like even if it's just like going and visiting for a week like don't be humble <laughs> I mean be humble but don't be like you know no 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 I'm not coming um because it is it is nice to get out of Oxford every every once in or Cambridge or whatever every once in a while because at the end of the day you are basically there for three years solid you don't have it like everyone else who gets to have a break three times a year Oxford is literally your permanent address for three years. So if you get a chance to leave for a bit, go take it. I, I like went and volunteered abroad um, during the breaks, which I really loved. And a lot of the time it actually ended up being cheaper than keeping my rent, which was, yeah. Um, but yeah, any opportunity to get out of, out of university, I'd say take it. I can definitely back that up. I will say I, I au paired for one summer and that was actually really nice to get out. Um, also, like just if you can explore the expand, uh, like surrounding areas in the breaks. I went for like really nice long walks. I took the train to Ely and then um, took long walks around the fens. Like you do get a little bit stir crazy, I think, when you spend all of your time in the same place where you study, which can like, be quite stressful. Um, our next question is what funding is available for care leavers and estranged students at Oxford and Cambridge? Um, I actually don't count officially as estranged because there are quite um, stringent uh, things that you have to show to student finance and things like that. So I don't get an extended student loan and it doesn't make me automatically eligible for the college and university bursaries that are available to estranged and care leaver students. Um, but despite this, I still get a lot of support from the university. I just flag things with my tutor and I say, you know, although it hasn't been like, I think you have to have three years of no contact with um, family members, which isn't my case. So although I say to my tutor, although this isn't, I'm not officially estranged, I am still estranged, it doesn't matter how long you spent uh, as estranged. And my college has helped me a lot more, um, which has been really helpful. I've never had any problems with finance because I, my, I've got a really understanding tutor and there's there's lots of funds available. I think one of the key things that I always like to stress to people is that these universities have so much money and they will give it to you <laughs> if you just ask. Um, and it is a shame that we have to ask and I know some people are uncomfortable with that, but it's really important. Even if you ask someone on your student union to help you draft emails, or if you reach out to groups like Class Act in Oxford and Cambridge to help you draft emails or talk to, talk to tutors, um, it is important that you access the help that is available to you. 
Um, just to add on to that, uh, a lot of universities also offer, as we've mentioned, um, sort of funding packages. So I believe Oxford is introducing one this year that um, is specifically for care leavers and estranged students. Um, but you can also get an Oxford um, crank start bursary, which is, I think, £3,000-ish off your tuition fees and then sort of a similar amount as a bursary that you get in three installments over the year. So you'll get like 1,200, 1,200, 1,500 or something along those lines each term. Um, and they can be really useful just to sort of top up any money that other people might be getting from elsewhere. Um, that's not exclusively for care leavers, um, but it's something that care leavers are often eligible for. Um, also for the care leavers applying to university who are in my position and might have turned 18 before and had to leave your placement before going to university, you are also eligible for um, state benefits, so universal credit. It can be difficult to sort of navigate, but also really worth doing, um, especially if you're working alongside A-levels or qualifications to get you into university, because there's sort of a funny amount of hours that you have to do and then they'll cut down um, if you have a job and then they'll cut down the bit, the benefits that you get. So it's really worth looking into them, seeing what you can do and getting that funding while you're eligible for it because, you know, it's something that you need and it will support you and makes life a lot easier while you're applying. Yeah, um, also the different colleges have various funds available. Uh, like for example, I, I had the Crank Start or as it was formerly called the Moritz Heyman Scholarship. Um, and I also got a bursary from my college Jesus, which was called the First 100 Bursary. And it was because the year I joined was 40 years since the first women <laughs> uh, entered Jesus College and so they'd all come together and put together this amazing bursary which they then gave to you know a woman in 2015 and so that's just to say that there are loads of different funds available at various different colleges so when you decide to apply um it might be worth checking on the website or maybe even getting in touch and saying hey have you got any more money <laughs> but more articulately than that um because it's great to know you know it might influence which college you decide to apply for you know if, if one has more money or one has a particular fund that you might be eligible it might help swing your decision great and i'm just going to jump in here as well and say um that the things that everyone's mentioning, so the Crank Start um, scholarship, for example, Helena is posting in the live chat as well links to find out more information about that. So if you're interested in what you're hearing um, throughout the, the uh, event, just click down there and um, you'll be able to find out a bit more information about them. Um, and also just a reminder that if you do want to ask questions, just remember to be putting them in the, in the chat. Um, don't be shy because we'll definitely answer them. Great. OK, Charlie, did you want to do the uh, next question? Yeah, so um, we've been asked whether it's possible to do a foundation year uh, at Oxford, Oxford and Cambridge. Um, so at Oxford, there is a foundation year available at Lady Margaret Hall. Um, I don't know that much about it, so maybe someone else can <laughs> explain a little bit. Um, and Cambridge actually announced a couple of years ago that they were going to start introducing um, a foundation year scheme as of 2020, which I imagine isn't happening anymore this year. I haven't seen anything about it. Um, and I imagine with all of the kind of viruses going on, that they've had other things to focus on, unfortunately, which is a shame because I think it would be a really valuable thing and help even out a lot of the, a lot of differences. But anyway, I'm not talking about that. So the, the foundation year is um, supposed to, yeah, even out in the policy. So the, I, from what I could read, I think, the offer generally for foundation year is ABB or BBB, um, which is a little bit lower than the general Cambridge offer. Um, and yes, you do a year to kind of get your knowledge um, up to the same level as someone who maybe went to a private school and has lots of educational advantages. Um, but after doing the foundation year, there's no guarantee of a place. So you, you do it and it's supposed to be free. So it, you won't be charged tuition fees for it. You do it, you learn stuff, and then you might get a place at Cambridge afterwards. Um, and just to jump in there as well, um, on things like the foundation year, when it comes to kind of official things about 
um, Oxford and Cambridge, their official websites tend to be pretty comprehensive as well about what they're thinking about when they're going to introduce it and that kind of thing. So I'm not, also not sure exactly when they're going to bring it in. Um, but if that's something that you're interested in, um, then I'd definitely say keep an eye on their official website and social media as well, um, if you want to just stay up to date um, with what's going on with that. Um, but yeah, that's just a little aside on that one. Um, Sophia, did you want to do the next question? Yeah, so the next question is, what mental health support is available for care experienced and estranged students? So as far as I'm aware, there's nothing that's like particularly focused on care experience or estranged at Oxford, but we do kind of get priority and more opportunities with the stuff that's already there. So for example, Oxford University has a counselling service, which every student is entitled to um, for free. Um, and when I originally went, they said that because I went, I think I went in my third or maybe second year, because I just hadn't really thought about mental health before then. Uh, and I went to see a counsellor and I think they usually offer eight or ten sessions to uh, the average student. But because I was care experienced, they said, just keep coming. Like, it's fine. We'll keep seeing you. So that was that was a nice sort of addition, I think, to just point out and say, you know, you are a priority. We will help you. Um, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, someone else want to jump in? Um, yeah, I can jump in here. Um, I'm sort of quite passionate about trying to make um, welfare support a bit more available for care leavers at Oxford over the next few years. Um, so I'm there for another three years, so I want to see what I can do. Um, but in other, you can also apply um, if you're eligible for um, disability support. Um, I think it's D DAS funding or something, DSA funding. Um, if you have a diagnosed mental health condition or in the case of things like depression um i think it doesn't have to be properly diagnosed it's if it's been available if it's available if it's been present for 12 months um i think in my experience um that can be quite useful because you can then use that funding specifically for um, private therapies um that's been something that i've been encouraged to do um, so that could be something also worth looking into. So the next question is, what problems do care leavers and estranged students face at Oxbridge? And one of the things that I struggled with, which wasn't directly at Oxford causing this, but it was just like me worrying about issues at home. And I actually had to miss a day um, last term to go back home to sort family issues out, which you know it's not nice to worry all the time do you know what I mean so I did have like a lot of anxiety worrying about you know what's going to happen <laughs> um and a, another thing was when I came to uni obviously as an adult on my own living on my own you know choosing what to do during the day and how to live my life I didn't know how to structure it so and because of that you know I didn't really have anyone to go to or ask you know what should I do with myself do you know what I mean how to manage social activities how to manage work and stuff like that how to manage you know me time which I think is one of the reasons why I didn't join any societies because I just didn't know how to cope with doing anything but work um so yeah but I think one of the ways I'm going to combat this next year, hopefully if we go back in October, is by making a schedule and joining more clubs and societies so that I can keep myself occupied and, and saying to myself, this is work time, this is me time. And if I hadn't got my work done by that point, I, I, still, I can still enjoy my me time because I don't need to earn it. So I think a schedule is, is going to be something I'll implement next year <laughs> but yeah um something that i think maybe isn't oxford and cambridge specific i'm not really sure how this happens at the universities but quite soon after i joined there was something at my college called a family day and it was where um new students could invite their 
parents or families up to come like see the college have a dinner in um the hall and just like have the oxford experience and i remember just hiding in my room for the entire day because i didn't want any of those awkward questions you know um i think i think bry will talk about this in a minute but you know just any of the classic sort of crying questions as, as to why my parents weren't there so that's quite a hard thing and then as a just a general application process i'm not sure if it's gotten better because i applied to uni in 2014 um but when i applied student finance forms were an absolute nightmare because online you had to put in details of both your parents and you couldn't get past a certain bit unless you filled out all the details and then i couldn't fill out all the details because i don't know where you know xyz lives or what this person's salary is or whatever um, so I think there are still quite a few hurdles that care experience people have to go through when applying to uni. Um, and that's something I'd like to see being gotten rid of if it hasn't already been gotten rid of. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a general sort of extra hurdle for us as care experience and as strange students. Um, yeah, touching on what Sophia said there, and also um, on the topic of disclosing your status to sort of friends. Um, obviously freshers and people moving in is quite the standard questions we all do it is sort of you know what do your parents do what have you done over the holidays those kinds of sort of generic questions um and they can be quite difficult to tackle um it's also it's just something that you have to do when you feel comfortable with it um for me I didn't tell them um I know what my parents do so I just told them what my parents do I do see my my family um, so I was quite happy to do that and it wasn't until later that I could, um, that I sort of, when I felt more comfortable with people that I told them I was a care leaver. I um, actually did it quite dramatically, I wrote like an article or something. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so it's, that is quite a problem for um, university students in general, so I would recommend maybe, not that you should have to, but sort of having a bank of sort of rehearsed answers to questions like that, just so that you can say, you know anything you want that can sort of divert any other more prying questions yeah I, I i want to jump back on like i completely agree with that i also think there's no right time to tell people like i didn't tell most of my friends until third year um some of my friends have gone through the entirety of uni without saying it and some people say it you know first day of freshers like when i did my masters i said it first day of freshers so it, it really just depends on what you're comfortable with and whether you want to tell these new people, you know, about your life, because it's completely up to you. I would also like to quickly say, um, there will be people, I don't know, I don't know if I shouldn't actually say that, like, you might not have this experience, but I've definitely had the experience of people thinking that my kind of status is a debate and saying things that are actually really unhelpful. And I think it can be really valuable to know when to, and how to kind of say, actually, I don't want to talk about this anymore like I don't you don't need to know any of these details you don't need to tell me what you think about my relationship with my family um and also know that no matter what people say and their attitude that there are people in the university who do support you and are there for you and that yeah those people don't necessarily need to have a place in your life <laughs> um our next question is what career support is there for care experience mystery students I'm actually currently now about to go into my final year. So this is a situation that I'm in right now. Um, it, it is a little bit stressful, this pressure of knowing that um, when, like, at least for me, because all of my funding is kind of provided by the university, that the minute I graduate, um, I would have to leave their accommodation and like no longer have the financial help to, um, to yeah live <laughs> um so something that i've actually done to mitigate this is move into privately owned accommodation this year um i don't know if this is the generally like the recommended thing to do but i was really stressed about being able to find housing when i graduated so i've moved into a private house now um knowing that i can kind of if necessary use my savings to keep living here once i've graduated and i won't have to go through a period of couch surfing um or anything like that um in terms of career things there are actually some kind of mentorship programs with um, organizations there was one I was looking into recently called Upreach which kind of I think what they do I might be wrong <laughs> so you might need to do some research 
um, yourself. I think what they do is they kind of match you up with someone to help you get into a career and give you advice on that. Um, Class Act actually at the moment are trying to organize some panels with people from like uh, disadvantaged backgrounds talking about how they broke into careers um, as well. So it is, it is stressful, but there are things that you can do to mitigate that. And there are associations um, available to help you. Um, I know that my college as well have like this bank of like 60 um, alumna who are contactable by email at any time to ask questions about a career. So that's like 60 ready-made contacts that I have in all sorts of industries. So definitely put feeders out with your college, with your university and like other associations and organizations in general as well. Um, because yeah, it's stressful, but you can, you can get through it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I completely, as the graduate, I, uh, I concur that it is stressful and you can get through it. Um, talking about Crank Start, the scholarship that uh, Brian and I were talking about earlier, um, which I sometimes refer to as the Moritz Heyman because that's what it was called when I was at Oxford. As part of that, they offer students a £2,000 like slot of money every single year to do an unpaid internship which is just beyond incredible in my mind, because obviously um, when you're at uni, it's a great idea to do an internship because it prepares you for the job market and the career world post university. But unless you're at like a really famous, I don't know, like business place or law firm or whatever, there's a good chance the internship might not be paid or it might be paid like really badly or they might not offer, they might only offer like transport costs or something and that scholarship was incredible like the only reason I have like a solid career now is because of the opportunity that I had from that scholarship um, which I think is incredible um, as a little like personal story I did some amazing things I, I worked at the Metropolitan Opera in New York thanks to the money from that scholarship I worked at the BBC in my first year which was also amazing and it's got me the job where I am today because I work in the music industry and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have my foot in the door if it hadn't have been for that first year internship. So I think like Oxford are really like pushing ahead with creating something like that and really trying to level out opportunities, which I'm obviously incredibly grateful for. Um, I just want to hop in here and mention the Lloyds Scholarship, um, which is with Lloyds Banking Group. Um, and it does have an application process and you have to be applying to certain um, universities. Uh, I think it's sort of like Oxford, Cambridge, Bristol, Sheffield, like sort of that kind of university. Um, uh, there's no specific degree you need for it. There's sort of some tests to do as an application. But once you get on, they offer um, an extra £1,500 funding. Um, and also an internship in your first summer. So I should be doing mine now, um, but obviously haven't been able to do that because of COVID, um, which is also funded. And I think the funding is sort of good funding. It's a couple of thousand pounds um, paid for the internship because it's 12, it should be a 12 week internship. Um, so that is worth looking into. You do have to do volunteering hours for it, but I've absolutely loved doing all of my volunteering hours this year. I've done lots of different things tutoring going into my school I've been involved with things in college um so it's worth doing and volunteering is also really fun so good to sort of carry on getting involved in um the next question is practical and emotional support from colleges so my college has been absolutely fantastic with practical support um I cannot fault them they've been brilliant with accommodation um as I mentioned earlier they sort of did that really quickly um I got that I got I was getting pictures of my room in maybe February March last year um and also they helped me pick my room so the way that the room ballot's done um is how we pick our rooms on like a balloting system but I was taken off the ballot and given a room that I didn't have to sort of I don't know bid for um uh, so I've got a room straight away um they've also as I've mentioned, I was there over lockdown um, and also a few weeks before they gave me some funding to buy food when the college canteen, college canteen, um, was op wasn't open. Um, so it's been really fab on the practical support and it is definitely, as I think it's been mentioned, that colleges are like rich. <laughs> 
so there is money there so do say if there's something you need go to your college and say is there any way you can support me with this um I've been sort of offered support for lots of different things from my college um there's been support for traveling up and down the country when I do go um back to my family and see my family um support for helping me you know if I want to do my driving lessons they've helped me look into that um so things like that are really fab and yeah it's definitely worth asking for I would just like to talk about the like emotional and mental support from college. So as an earth scientist um, doing a sciences subject, I arrived to Oxford a week before all the freshers doing this programme called MPLS, which is for <laughs> science based subjects like physics, earth sciences, medicine. Um, but then by, I stayed in a different college. I stayed at Worcester, which is not where I'm at. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So by the time that week had finished, I had two days where I went straight to my college, but it was only me there. Um, and straight away, the welfare team were on it. You know, they were asking me, you know, how can we support you and stuff like that. So in terms of the college that I'm at, the emotional and mental support has been really good because they've always been there for me. Um, but in terms of like practical things, I haven't really had the support for that so I still go back to where I'm from um during the vacations but I don't have I, I because of my distance away from Oxford I don't qualify for um storage so I have to bring all my stuff with me to and from Oxford each term which is really difficult with two suitcases and public transport so in terms of like practical things I haven't really had support with that um, which is the opposite experience to Bry but again this is just my experience so it will depend from college to college. Just to give a bit of um, a Cambridge perspective I've had I've had pretty similar experiences but I found that in terms of practical support anything that I've needed um, that wasn't immediately offered to me the minute I've asked for it um, I've been able to get it and I know that also the kind of um, college level student union I it, it Cambridge they're called JCRs I don't know if it's the same as Oxford um, are really helpful they have um, like elected students who are there to kind of help you with things like this so that if you're having trouble getting through to someone about something that you need you can get in contact with this student union rep and say can you <laughs> use your sway um to ask ask for something that you need um, can I just, um, and in terms sorry of, can sorry. i just pop in on that um bit about reps please um yeah, of course so i'm not sure about cambridge but at oxford class act is um run by the student union as part of the student union um and there has been situations where people might contact class act if um, for my college doesn't have a specific student union rep that I'm aware of on our um, sort of little committee um, so contacting the student union directly and contacting things such as class act can also be really helpful because um, they know where to get centralised uni support rather than the ones from the colleges. I would also just like to add that I haven't asked for physical support so yeah I'm sure if if I do ask, which I will when I go back, then it will be offered to me. And I also know that my college are offering um, like travel grants. And this isn't just for like care leave of specific people. This is for everyone who are a certain distance away from Oxford. So that will really help. But yeah, definitely ask for support. <laughs> Um, so our next question is, how can my college keep me safe? Um, I have some personal experience with this because this is something that I was quite concerned about, definitely last year as well. I went to the Porter's Lodge, which is like the front reception get front reception desk, but they're also like massively jumped up. Like they can, they're they're basically like security. They're like they'll give you tea in the night if you go to them. You just want someone to talk to. They collect your post. They sign for all your pass. Pa parcels there's always someone there they're always first aid trained they're quite often they have experience um quite often have worked in the police or uh things like that so those are the people to go to um generally if you have any kind of problem but i organized a meeting with the senior porter so the person who's in charge of this front desk and kind of explained i didn't really give any details i just said i potentially might need um you know 
there to be a little bit more security to make sure that random people can't come into college and they were completely open to this they explained all of the ways that they could kind of secure college for me if necessary um and make me feel safe uh and luckily <laughs> we've never needed to but it's made me feel much more safe and they're so understanding and lovely and at the end of the day they're just normal people who are really understanding um so yeah um, yeah, to, ju to jump on that, I've had I've had a similar experience and the, the Porter's Lodge have been absolutely fantastic with that. Um, basically, I think it's a question of asking and getting again. So just letting college know if you need something. Um, for example, as part of one of my plans um, at my college, we all had a fob, which is basically like an electronic key to get into certain places. And there were certain places that most students weren't allowed, but my fob had access to those places if I ever needed to go hide somewhere or if I needed to get out of the, I don't know, public area. So again, it's just it's just about asking. And usually, usually they're quite good with following through. Um, I just want to back up the porters point before I go on to my next point. Um, I've got quite a good relationship with our porters and um, particularly for being there over lockdown because they were kind of the only people there to talk to um, but their porters really really are open to anything in my experience all the porters I've met have been lovely um, and also are really just supportive and chatty and will do what they can um, but at my college and I'm not 100% sure about other colleges but my college specifically has junior deans which are sort of like post somebody might be able to correct me but I think they're postgraduate students um that sort of have um specialized welfare training um they are in a paid role to support students as part of the welfare team um and they have been a really fab contact um when I've had welfare issues um even if they're not the first person I've contacted I've had follow-up emails from them um, for particularly for sort of mental health issues if you have mental health problems um, during the night they've been really good to sort of get support from um, and also Oxford again I don't know about Cambridge has a anonymous phone line I think it's called Nightline um, that is also really good um, if you just need someone to chat to in terms of keeping yourself safe or them helping you keep you, sa you safe um, with any mental health problems. There is that at Cambridge as well, um, just thought I'd say. <laughs> um, so our next question is, can I apply with extenuating circumstances? Um, so in case you don't know, extenuating circumstances is like um, an additional part of your university application that's generally filled out by some kind of person who knows you, like a, a tutor or potentially a doctor or something like that from your sick form, um, kind of explaining that either you've really succeeded despite having gone through certain things or certain things have happened to you which might have impeded uh, you performing as well as really you should have done. It's basically someone backing up saying that they believe that you have a lot of potential that you might not necessarily be showing in your A-levels. So I had one of these forms um, for my application. I don't know if it made any difference. I don't know if it helped me <laughs> help my application anyway, um, but it just, it was really helpful I don't even know who read it actually, but I felt like when I got to um, like the interview stage that people were uh, kind of aware of things and understanding um, and things like that. But yeah, so I basically got this just by talking to my tutor uh, and saying, is this something that you can do for me? Um, and um, we just had a really short chat. I obviously had to explain kind of what had been going on, um, but she was really nice and supportive about that. But yeah, this is this is something that you can do and something that I would recommend doing if you feel like you need it because um, yeah, it's it's important <laughs> that people are aware. And I think if you have overcome something and still are achieving and doing well, or you know, if you're being held back, then people should know about it. Um, it's also possible to apply for extenuating circumstances for exams specifically. And so sort of your A-level exams, um, I applied for them with my head of sixth form. She had to write like, you know, similar to what Charlie's just mentioned, just a bit about what was going on, what was happening. Um, at that point in time, there was quite a few ha things happening. Um, again, I have no idea who saw that. I have no idea whether it had any difference, but it was um, almost a comfort to me to know that it was there. 
Um, so it is definitely worth also looking into that if that's something that might apply to you. Great. Well, thanks so much, everyone. They've been really, really interesting answers. And um, I think we've actually covered such a lot in the last 40 minutes or so. Um, and just to everyone who's watching as well, if there are any questions that you have that you think of sort of after this or just before the end of the video, feel free to put them in the um, YouTube live section. Or if it's a question perhaps that you didn't want to put in the live section that other people can see um, or a different question that you might have, then feel free just to DM us on social media um, and we'll definitely get back to you. Um, so that concludes the uh, question section. Um, and so just before we finish, we're now just going to go around everyone who's on the panel uh, and ask them about one resource they used um, when they were applying that they found really useful. Um, so Sophia, did you want to kick off? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think we might have mentioned it already, but there's a great website called Propel, which is a website run by the charity Become, which is a charity for care leavers. And on the website, they advertise as much financial information as possible that each university in the country offers to young people from our situations. Um, I also want to give a cheeky sort of shout out to anyone applying right now. Um, I also run a YouTube channel called Care Leaver Sophia. And on the channel, there's a two part video about how I applied to Oxford and then my experience there. So if you are considering applying, um, I would say go watch it. I promise it's not just for the views. Um, <laughs> I do just talk a bit more in depth about my experience. Um, and you can also find me on social media at Sophia Hall Sachs. So that's S-A-X. Um, and yeah, feel free to DM me with any questions. My resource is um, just Instagram accounts run by Cambridge College students. Um, so like I said, there's these things called JCRs, which are like the College and Airport Student Unions. And some colleges have an Instagram account specifically for the JCR, which is run by the union representatives. Um, and many of them are specifically for applicants as well. They do daily life videos, they do Q and A, they do some really useful information that just helps demystify your experience, to be honest, because I, I don't know <laughs> about people watching, but I had nothing, I knew nothing about Cambridge before I came here. Um, and I think it's really helpful. Um, I, as a law student, used Pathways to Law, which um, was a Sutton Trust run program that offered various different um, sort of workshops. We did some on social media presence as professionals, but then we also did stuff on um, different sort of lectures on different areas of law. They offered um, work experience. So I shadowed a barrister um, for three days um, and they also do a residential period, um, which I think is a week or four days long. That's really good. Um, and they do offer that for other subjects I believe so I think there's definitely our pathways to science um, so that is really worth looking into and Sutton Trust summer schools in general are really good to get involved and you can put them on your application as um, a super curricular sort of program. Um, also shameless self pro promo um, I have an Instagram account um, it's at do they care underscore um, that is also quite I've put some resources on there and links on there for um, applying to university now. The resource that I found most useful was the Unique Summer School. And this is a summer school run by Oxford. It's completely free. They fund everything. You do have to apply for it and get selected. Um, but one way in which this was really useful was that it helped me decide that this was the degree that I want. I wanted to pursue. But also we had access to the student ambassador's personal statements so we could read through them and ask them questions about the personal statements that they had written and these were personal statements from you know successful applicants so it was really nice to have that um like hands-on experience if you get what I mean um, and I also have an Instagram account it's not anything to do with care leavers it's a fitness page but my DMs are open to anyone in this situation or if you just want to ask questions about Oxford and it's at clof.it <laughs> so yeah great well thanks so much everyone they're really useful resources and um, as with the rest of it Helen has been putting links to all of this down in the live um, stream comments um, so you can 
click through and find out more. Um, but that's it for today. So thanks everyone for watching who has been. Um, we'll make this video available on YouTube after this is finished as a live stream. So you'll be able to go, go back over it. Um, and we always add timestamps as well um, within about a week so that you can kind of click to different bits of the video. Um, and this has been part of a, a, a bigger series that Inside Uni have been doing. So lots of different Q and A's um, with different panels. Um, so we've got quite a few on YouTube already. Um, I think the last one we did was a joint event with the Oxford and Cambridge Afro-Caribbean Societies on applying as a black student. Um, and we've got some really exciting events coming up um, on international applicants um, and also some of the uh, scholarships that you can get uh, as a master's student. Um, I think they're coming up in about the next week or so. Um, so definitely like us on different social media so that you can keep in touch with um, which of those events are coming up or on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook um, and obviously YouTube as well. Um, and I hope you enjoyed today. I, I certainly thought it was really, really interesting just to hear from everyone. Um, and there's some really great advice in there too. Um, and so, yeah, hope to see you guys at Oxford or Cambridge soon. And um, thanks again for tuning in. Bye.